<laughs> yeah, that's happening. Right. So, uh, yeah, it's a weird thing writing books because you kind of spend a lot of time doing it and then you kind of feel like it's done, but then it has to be edited and proofread and it takes a while to get published. And then people read it and they go, oh, yeah, I read this book and they want to ask you about it. And you think, I kind of finished writing that like six months ago and I've been working on something. And so it kind of feels a bit like everything's out of uh, joint, especially if you're doing one book after another. So people will ask me about Verissimus. And I think I've written another whole book since then. And uh, I've kind of been, I'm kind of in the middle of writing the one after that now. And I'm like, so I have to kind of, like my memory is not that great sometimes. I'm like, I try and remember what what's in for Christmas. <laughs> so what else is I've read? I have to go back and read it again. Like, you know, I, especially you can't, once you've been doing something for that long, you think, all right, I've got closure on that now. All right, like, let's forget about that, move on to the next thing. So I need to go, oh, yeah, that thing. Yeah, yeah, that's that's out now. Like, I need to go back and remember like, what's all in it. Well, I'm glad that I caught you during the actual promotional stage. Like, yeah, I'm just I'm warming up now. So I've, I've gone back and I've kind of been looking at it again. And it's, yeah, it's funny because there's, I mean, I do obviously I remember most of what's in it. But then occasionally there'll be little bits. When you write a book and you haven't looked at it for a while, you think, I don't remember that bit. <laughs> Why? And you can think, oh, that's quite good. Why? Jeez, I don't remember writing that. Why? It's better than I thought it was. Oh, so sometimes, I'm sometimes it comes as a yeah, but I mean, the guy that wrote this is a genius. Like, like so, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's kind of a it's an interesting experience, and uh, yeah, it's all about the artwork, really. Though, and Zen and Ofraga is the illustrator, and yeah. he did a really good job, uh, I think. Well, we'll see. I think the thing about artwork is it's more of a subjective thing, so not necessarily. You know, people have different tastes when it comes to to art, but I like his artwork. I thought it was great. So you know, like I'm I'm happy with it. Like, and I think a lot of people like me or like the kind of it's very expressive and very colourful. Like, so that's the that's what we were going for. And I think he did a, an excellent job at like uh, doing it in that doing it in that style. I mean, basing uh, it just off of the front cover or like the the title image. I mean, I can already tell that it's going to be quality inside as well. Like that, the the cover image kind of made yeah. me really That's excited. what the inside looks like. Sorry? Where, that's what the inside looks like too. Sometimes you get tricked. Then you know, the front's are like really good and then you open up and it's like matchstick man or something. <laughs> <laughs> because they say you shouldn't take a book by its cover, but no, the, end, the artwork inside is, is similar to the artwork on the cover. Definitely. And... Uh, yeah, we put so much work. So I didn't realize, I'll tell my, my little story that I tell everyone is I spoke to Alacos, one of the um, the guys who worked on uh, a best-selling uh, graphic novel about philosophy called Logic Comics that came yeah. out a few years back. And uh, I had a video call with him and I was just kind of like chatting to him about the artwork and the book. And he just kind of mentioned in passing, they said it took them six or seven years to do Logic Comics. And my jaw kind of dropped. I was like, what? Because like, I was still kind of thinking we could get it done in a year. So we worked hell for leather. Like we had a kind of real process. Like I tied kind of close tabs and tried to kind of like figure out ways to economize on time. It still took us two or three years. So I now realize it's a, it's a major undertaking to do a, a graphic novel on that scale. But what you do is you'll write the script. You've got to write the dialogue. You've got to have an idea of the story. Then you've got to describe what the panels look like. Yeah. Um, and then you, the artist will do concept art. They'll do thumbnails to show roughly where things are. Then they'll pencil the artwork. Then they'll ink it. Then it gets colored. And then you go through the usual process of kind of copy editing and proofreading and everything. So, was, And we had consultants as well. We had a, two editors. We had a... Um, an advisor, like we had several people that advised us on the history and stuff, but uh, someone that advised us on language, a guy that advised us on the uh, architecture and the uniforms and clothing and stuff for authenticity. So there was like, I don't know, like six, seven, eight people, like, you know, probably in total kind of involved in, in different ways, putting the, the book together, some more than others. Um, but yeah, it's quite a long process. And so, for instance, like one of the things we had to change really early on when the guy came on board who was helping us 
uh, Bodomancius is a uh, he does historical reenactment. He's one of these guys that dresses up at the weekend as a Roman legionary, and uh, so he was saying, you know, that's the wrong sort of belt buckle and things like that. Um, the first thing he did was tell us all the, sh the swords were too short, like because they all Zeh had drawn them with a gladius, and he said, no, at this point in history, they used the Spatha sword, which is slightly longer. It's better for fighting cavalry, apparently. Yeah. Like, so we kind of have to dig into these real kind of more obscure details but exactly when would they have been using these different pieces of equipment sometimes we don't know the answer for sure and uh, Z had to go through and uh, add a couple of inches to all the swords in every panel and things like that the other thing we did at first we didn't think about this but just kind of Z was drawing stuff that he thought looked cool and it wasn't until we got the consultant on board and he went you know, some of your legionaries are holding their sword in their left hand, and like he goes, that would never happen. Like they, they all have to be right-handed, like because they have to fight information. And we're like, oh man, really? It's like we can't just. That's harder than just adding a couple inches. That means we've got to like change the whole, like redraw the whole panel and stuff because the guy's going to have to be standing the other way around and thing. Like, but yeah, that was we. So we put a lot of effort into doing stuff and then redoing it to try and make it as accurate as possible and i guarantee you every time the the history nerds the things that they get most upset about are the things that are actually most historically accurate usually mm -hmm. right but because people don't believe stuff like you know already i think some of the people that read it and they're like that didn't happen and i'm like well like, no that's the bit that's, that's straight out one of the history books like so people are sometimes surprised i think the marcus aurelius as well it's really weird He's an odd figure because people think they know Marcus Aurelius from reading the meditations. Yeah. And I've heard many times people saying that we don't know anything about him. And that's amazing because how could we not know anything about him? Like, he's one of the most famous Roman emperors. He was a big deal like back in the day. Of course, we, we know a lot about him. We know far more about him than, than people seem to realize. Yeah. We have three Roman histories of his reign. We have lots of references and other texts. We have inscriptions and archaeological um, evidence, evidence from coins and medallions. We have a cache of his private letters. We have um, his legal rescripts, like in the Roman legal digest, showing the legislation that he passed. So a bunch of stuff. Um, the you know, well, there's a lot we don't know about him, but we've got quite a lot of information. There are many biographies of him actually and so sometimes people think when we're writing about it that we're making the stories up but no we're actually very 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 faithful like meticulously faithful to the the historical sources but of course when you do that there's stuff that you have to there's gaps in the stories usually or there's bits that are ambiguous so you can't uh make a movie or or tell a story without especially visually without sometimes having to kind of plug gaps yeah. and resolve ambiguities so there's there may be a contradiction in the histories and you think well you kind of have to pick one version like if you're going to tell a visual version of the story um and a boring sort of academic uh so this is a boring biography and an academic biography you can say one historian says this and another one says that and you can kind of pick it apart but you can't do that in a graphic novel like in the graphic novel you need to kind of go okay we're picking this version of the story and that's what we're going to depict so we we did that but we tried to be as faithful as we could and in some ways actually in the visual format i found in my opinion we could be in a sense, even more, in some ways, we could be more faithful to the historical evidence than an academic prose biography would be. And that seems odd to say, but the reason is that in the ancient biographies, they'll describe dreams often, mm -hmm. and they'll describe visions and nightmares, and they'll describe rumors and gossip and lies and propaganda and things like that. And the way that we we thought well how can we use this material like because the historians will say well we're not really sure what to make of this dream or they'll say that this seems like gossip so we're not really sure if it's true it's probably not true yeah. so we thought how can we use this kind of mess of material and we thought well actually the way to do it is just to present it as what it is show like the dream as a dream show the gossip there's some people gossiping about marx aurelius and so the reader can then 
you know, decide, well, this is just a bunch of people gossiping, it doesn't really mean anything, or they can think maybe there's no smoke without fire, or they can think maybe it tells us something about the public perception yeah. of Marcus Aurelius, if people are spreading um, these rumours about him, whether or not the rumours are actually true. It, it, it shows that maybe there were people that didn't like him, for instance, if there's, there's widespread rumours criticising him. Um, so it allows us in some ways to actually get a, a more vivid, a more faithful um, sense of what the, the Roman histories are, are trying to tell us and things that are kind of, can be lost sometimes in a, a prose biography. That's how I feel about it anyway. Do you think that it will become a movie based around? Um, yeah, I think Ridley Scott is going to pick it up and make it release it as a prequel to Gladiator. And uh, I think they should cast um, Russell Crowe uh, this time. Paradoxically, they can use the de aging uh, software. <laughs> like, oh, they, they could cast them. I think actually, Russell Crowe now, we've kind of ruined this maybe. But I think hmm. you saw he plays Zeus. Yes. Um, uh, spoiler, spoiler alert. I think it's in the trailers or whatever, right? For the Thor movie. Um, but I think Russell Crowe now, older Russell Crowe, like with mature Russell Crowe could possibly play Marcus Aurelius. Yeah, that's what I was that's thinking. Would that be? Now. It would yeah. work. That would work. But like, then, I think, yeah, it wouldn't work. <laughs> we want an Australian uh, Marcus Aurelius. That would be that'd be cool. But then again, it's um, movie, so so know. maybe someone will make a, a movie out of it or an animation or something like that. That would that would be cool. It's always a possibility when you write a graphic novel. There's different ways of writing it. So it can just be like a dialogue bump where you write a lot of dialogue and you just go, okay, to an artist, you illustrate that. And the illustrations could be matchstick men. Like, and that might work. Like, actually, it might be cool. But we decided to go for a much more visually rich, detailed, cinematic kind of approach. So the, the script for it um, describes the, the shots um, like you would uh, uh, a shot in, um, like a, in a movie. Um, like a storyboard, a, yeah. Like this is a um, like a medium shot from a low angle, and well, it's yeah. an over the shoulder shot and stuff like that. So it's, that's how the script is is laid out, basically. So in a much more um, cinematic uh, style. So I think it would actually make kind of a good movie, but we haven't sold the movie rights yet. Like so, who knows? Maybe maybe one day, like uh, that may happen. You should try and send one to Ridley Scott. I might have made it too expensive. Like, there was too much fighting in it and stuff like that. Like, never, never, man. No way. A lot. Everyone loves that stuff. <laughs> I like that stuff. And then I thought, wow, yeah, there's a lot of huge battles in this movie. So I was kind of pleased with that. And some kind of surreal fantasy, like dreams and visions and stuff in it. And some like heavy philosophy. We tried really hard. So I didn't want to just have like a bunch of guys um standing about talking about philosophy i thought that'd be really boring but i didn't want i mean again people who think we don't know anything about marx aurelius we we you can tell a story about marx aurelius it's a uh an action packed story um like it's full of action it's very colorful and vivid and uh, visually varied and there's a lot of per interpersonal drama as well at the same time but there's also a lot of philosophy his philosophy does impinge on and shape his actions as emperor and uh so we we tried though to kind of weave the philosophy into the action so that you know and marcus often will talk about things that he sees and kind of turn them into metaphors for philosophy so we tried to kind of really imagine what he was seeing and kind of connect it to what was going on and then have him thinking of um, like, uh, felt like if he's watching some guys wrestling or whatever, he, you know, he says uh, to himself later, um, the art of philosophy is more like uh, that of a boxer than a, a, a gladiator because a gladiator can drop his sword, whereas a, a boxer is always armed, all he has to do is clench his fist. That's a metaphor for clenching your fist is a metaphor for concentrating on your moral principles your philosophical principles right? it's like they're always there all you have to do is kind of focus on them right once you've you've learned how to use them you know no one can ever kind of like take them away from you like a 
you know, your possessions like a sword. So he makes philosophy out of just kind of like observing gladiators and boxers and stuff. Um, so we thought, well, we need to kind of weave this in. And if there was a scene where we thought, oh, we're going to have to talk about some stuff, um, but it's not related to the action, then there's a way around that whereby you can set the conversation in an unusual scene and have action that unfolds in parallel. So we've got them talking uh, at the Circus Maximus in one scene where they're watching a chariot race. And so they're not talking about the chariot race, they're talking about something else, but it allows us to have some act, some quite simple action kind of unfolding in the background that makes it more interesting to look at. Mm -hmm. while and there's a kind of vague kind of mirroring between some of the themes that they're talking about and some of the things that's happening in the background in the chariot race. So like uh, we thought, we tried to really think of creative ways to tie the philosophy in with the, the visual action and, uh, and make, it, make it seem a lot more engaging. So I hope that we've done that. It's a very kind of dense book in a way. There's a lot in it. Um, and some people ask me, you know, the, one of the weirdest things is everybody wants to give it to their kids, right? And then that, we have the same, I've had the same conversation about 20 times now where people say, ah, I'm going to buy like half a dozen copies for my, like, uh, my kids and their friends and all that. And I'm like, you know it's got crucifixion in it and torture and a lot of siege warfare and like there's like um you know some kind of paranormal horror and like a plague and a couple of guys in a graveyard talking about like coming to terms with their own mortality and quite heavy philosophical terms and all that and then i'm like i, I, I describe I definitely describe it as pg right and then and some nudity in it as well a, a little bit and then, and then the next thing is they go, no, nah, my kids will be fine with that. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. Well, I, you know, well, I guess we'll, we'll see. But um, I mean, kids watch pretty grown up things now. So uh, I think that maybe they'll be cool with it. You can't really put a rating on the front cover, can I'm you? No, <laughs> I've no idea. I think some distributors may have asked for a rating. And I think, I can't remember what we said it was, but we did come up with a, a rating. But yeah. It will be interesting to see how I, I kind of feel like it would appeal to a younger demographic than the normal books and stoicism, but I wouldn't I would say it's kind of more aimed at older like adults and older teens, perhaps. Yeah, rather I think than early twenties, that sort of age, like around yeah. my age. Yeah. I think would be very interested in. I know I'm interested in it. Like I'm I'm huge in stoic philosophy and ancient times. Learning, learning all about that, and why not have pictures? <laughs> yeah, why not? Like it's a bit of a different. There's not that many. There are some graphic novels about ancient Greece and Rome, but um, there's more of them in Greece. But uh, there's not that many of them, so it's kind of it's a bit of a different. There's not many graphic novels about philosophy. Logic comics is one of the few. There's some illustrated books about it. But I really believe that people that are interested in philosophy um, are, are kind of into stories, basically. And uh, I feel like there's a kind of craving for that, actually. I enjoy stuff. Any movies and things that have got a bit of philosophy on them. I'm always, like, um, you know, delighted to see that. And, I, you know, what I'd say to people is in the ancient world, um, philosophy was taught in lectures, in letters, in books, in seminars. But it was also taught, many people learned about philosophy um, from satirical plays and anecdotes and kind of gossipy stories. Um, and that that's not a thing anymore, really. Yeah. Like, not in the same way. So th there was a long tradition, actually, that died off, pretty much, of people getting philosophy um from store anecdotes and stories and often of a more light-hearted way diogenes the cynic who is a, a famous greek philosopher who, who didn't really leave any writings behind basically um much of what we know about him seems to come from satirical plays like plays that were meant to be kind of uh you know uh comedy yeah. um but they nevertheless have a, a kind of philosophical message to them so, uh, yeah, like, I, I think, you know, this is something that we could do, we would do well to reintroduce more 
um, philosophical anecdotes and stories. Like I think the thing you find this in the Eastern traditions, like in Buddhism, there's a lot of anecdotes about uh, you know Buddhist uh, monks and so on. Um, and we we know a few about Greek philosophers, but I, there are more in the literature that people have forgotten about. I'd like to kind of bring more of that back. I think people get a lot out of it. Not everybody wants to sit and read, you know, Plato's Republic or, you know, like a, a long book about philosophy. Sometimes people just want like a, a little kind of quip or story that they can, you know, get them thinking. Yeah. Not everyone's a Harvard professor or something like that or a massive scholar. Yeah, like the most famous story about Diogenes the Cynic, and the one that most people know is that, uh, and it's, this is probably not historically true, but it's a famous story, that Diogenes lived like a beggar, basically. He went around um, naked or semi-naked. He lived in a, a, a big urn um, outside the, the city walls. And he, uh, supposedly Alexander the Great, so the richest, most powerful uh, ruler in the world came to see him and said, is there anything I can do for you? And Alexander said, yes. Could you step aside? You're blocking the sunlight. Um, and that's kind of a famous story. But, you know, people can go away and they can kind of chew that over. It's very similar to the kind of anecdotes you get about Buddhist monks and uh, Eastern uh, wise men. But we, we have a bunch of surviving anecdotes like that about Greek philosophers. I think people should talk about them more. I think we should... Or you should do a series of graphic novels that are based on the lives of the Stoics. I think that would be intriguing. What do you think? Ryan Hardy and Stephen Hanselman have a book called Lives of the Stoics. It's all, all just full of anecdotes about. So there is quite a lot of material there. Um, I think also Socrates we know enough about that we could potentially. Actually, here's a, like, I guess a little bit of kind of chit chat about uh publishing and writing books and stuff the idea that was presented to me initially was to do a graphic novel about socrates and i said that's impossible and the editor that i was speaking to said why do you say that and i say because i said to do a thing about socrates the conversations would be too complicated it wouldn't really work in a graphic novel format like they you'd have big walls of text like <laughs> whereas the, the stoics are more concise they they have more aphorisms and stuff like that it'd be easier and there's more action and stuff in the story and he said yeah that's exactly what we found when we tried to kind of look into doing this it was difficult to avoid making it too wordy for a graphic novel and uh, so i said that for a while but that was years ago I had that conversation. Now, what, for having written a graphic novel, I look back on it now and think, actually, I, I think I might have been wrong about that. Like, I think there might be a way of doing a, a graphic novel about Socrates that has the philosophy in it. Um, but it would take a little bit of creative thought to figure out how to make it more concise enough. It would be hard, like... You know, I think I can do it now. I think three or four years ago, if I tried to do it, I wouldn't have been able to do it. Yeah. But I think I, I know a bit more about the format. I could maybe figure out ways to make that work. Well, now you've made this one work with Marcus Aurelius, which took yeah. some time, I can imagine. I think I made but you've got experience now. So, I mean, taking on another challenge. <laughs> I wish I had a copy of it to show you. I don't, I've got these little stickers and that's all I've got because I was traveling around too much. But there are copies of it. The, the publisher having and some people have got review because I've just got these like st little stickers that say Happy Christmas on it. But I don't have um I don't have any copies of the book yet. I've never seen it. Other people are reviewing it and stuff and I, think, I haven't seen it. My but uh so my publisher sent me a video. They kind of flicked through it and sent me a video said this is what it looks like. But uh I haven't got a copy because I was traveling around too much. I didn't have anywhere that they could post it to. So the <laughs> <laughs> you were just talking about that. Yeah, you've been all over the place, man. Like, yeah, I don't know where it'll be. So, um, and they're posting one now to a place that I thought I was going to be, but I'm no longer going to be. Like, so <laughs> I thought I was going to be uh, in the States. And then, the, the, so they're sending a, a bunch of these books, but I'm actually, I've changed my plans now and I'm going to Montreal. Uh, so in a few weeks time. Um, so I'm not going to be around. Oh, eventually I'm going to get a copy of this book, like probably about a year after everyone else has got a copy, and I'll I'll, I'll read it belatedly. 
and uh, it's got typos in it or, or something, but I hope not. But uh, yeah, it was it was a big adventure doing a graphic novel. I never really planned to do that. I kind of stumbled into doing it, and I'm glad I did because it was a, a challenge, but I feel like I really learned a lot from it. I read a lot of books on graphic novels. There's a surprising number. I, first of all, what I thought I was going to do was sit in the library all day and just read loads of graphic novels. Because, like, we went through a process of pitching the book and doing a proposal and had a lot of discussions around it. And at no point did anybody ask me if I'd ever really read many graphic novels, because I hadn't. Um, but luckily, I read a comic religiously when I was a teenager called 2000 AD. Mm. Why, and it was a kind of more, slightly more adult cause Judge Dredd and stuff like that. In it. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of similar in some ways to the tone of uh, graphic novels. And I, I kind of took a lot of inspiration from some of the stories in, in 2000 AD. I went back and I, I read some of that. And I tried reading a lot of graphic novels, but I found really I wasn't really getting much inspiration from them. Uh, so I read a, bit, a bunch of books about how to write graphic novels. Side note, the best one is a famous book called Making Comics by a guy called Scott McLeod that's like the kind of masterpiece. I read that book from cover to cover like two or three times, and I read one of his other books as well. Like, And then I read Stan Lee's book about writing comics and stuff, and a bunch of other ones. I probably read three or four, like to try and kind of really figure out the art, and there's a lot to know about it. Um, but the thing I took most inspiration from actually rather than reading graphic novels, was watching movies. I went back and re-watched every Sword and Sandals type movie that I could think of about Romans, Greeks, Vikings, uh, kind of like barbarians. So there's a movie about the Scythians even that I found that's really, it's one of my favourites, a Russian movie, I think. Wow. Um, so I found some really obscure things and kind of made for TV things. And, you know, I sat through that Liz Taylor Cleopatra thing that goes on for like three hours or whatever, wherever long it is. Like, um, well, all um... these, yeah, like it's, uh, it takes my patience to watch really long movies like that these days. And I've seen it before, like years and years ago. So I'm going to have to watch it again. And as I went through it, I'd kind of like photograph the screen or on my computer, I'd kind of do screen captures if there was a shot that I liked. And then I'd go away and think, can we kind of utilize this shot for, uh, you know, one of the panels in the, in the graphic novel? So it ended up being more cinematic because I took a lot more inspiration from movies and TV shows than I did from comics and graphic novels in the end. Did you end up watching Caligula at all? I watched Caligula, yeah. I did watch Caligula. That was weird as well because I've seen it before and I think I made my friend watch it with me who's like a, a Latin uh, scholar and we were like, this is a super weird... Uh, you're laughing, right? Because maybe in case... For anybody who hasn't seen Caligula, it's, it, it, is very, it is very interesting in terms of the Roman history, right? But... I guess it takes one aspect of the Roman history as it's sometimes it's quite violent and perverse and salacious. And so some modern accounts would maybe downplay that a bit, but they just went, um, they went all for it. All for it and magnified those parts and made it almost pornographic. And uh, <laughs> uh, I think was it was censored or something when it came out. It was it's pretty it's pretty extreme. So uh, yeah, that was interesting. There were probably like bits of that that I to inspiration for. When we did our graphic novel, I quite like doing things that are over the top. So we went for kind of um, gore and horror. As I was writing it, actually, I, I, I kind of knew that I would put some elements of horror in it. And then as I was kind of in the middle of doing it, I suddenly realized there are, whole, there are definitely chunks of this that are horror more than I read. That might surprise some people that Marks or Lewis's story would have horror elements. There are elements of supernatural horror in it like so in the in the way that the roman historian of course there are because the roman historians believe in supernatural stuff yeah. so their version of events has some elements of supernatural uh horror in it they believe in omens they believe in dreams um like they believe in uh like the oracles 
why they take that those kind of things quite seriously. Um, and so, like, if you kind of take that as seriously as they do, so from our perspective, it, it, there are things that seem pretty kind of disturbing and supernatural and like a, a cult or paranormal horror, I guess. And I, I, I so I decided we would kind of actually play into those more because I thought in a graphic novel, I was desperate to get away from this thing of a couple of guys just standing around talking. And I was like, no, we'll, be like, we'll, like, we'll have these nightmares and, you know, the visions and really, you know, show people stuff that um, they won't believe, mm. but the Romans believed uh, was happening. It's like uh, 300. They started with a graphic novel first and then made that into a movie. But then that graphic novel was kind of like you had themes of supernatural horror in it. A bit like that, yeah. Oracle. 300 is quite sparse, the graphic novel, actually. Like I read, that was one of the ones that I did read. And funnily enough, I didn't take that much inspiration from it. I mean, I wish that I, try, I tried to. I mean, I looked at it, but I, for some weird reason, I was getting more from, I'm trying to think what the movies were that I, I took more inspiration from. Actually, probably the Scythian. Um, I got a lot more from, from than I did from 300 for some, for some reason. Um, I did get some ideas from that. But I, I would have thought it would be one of the main ones. I should probably take more inspiration from Gladiator than I did from 300. I like 300, but it didn't kind of influence this book that much. I and like I guess one of, the, one of the Gladiators, a, a surprising, it's an odd film. Like, it's difficult to pin down why it's so good. Um, it may just be that Russell Crowe just gives a really good performance in it. I mean, there's other things that are good about it, but it's got a kind of X Factor Gladiator because there hadn't been a Sword and Sandals movie that was like a really big success for like decades, I think. Yeah. And uh, and then people tried to follow up with a bunch of other Sword and Sandals movies, big budget ones that that never really came anywhere near it. So it was kind of lightning in a bottle, Gladiator. Although they're now making a sequel to it. Um. Yeah, yeah I think they may have started filming it. Like. Yeah, they're making a sequel to Gladiator. Nick Cave, the Who's musician. That? Nick, you know Nick Cave from Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds. No, the I don't. Music, kind of indie musician. Um, yeah, he wrote. He's famous for right, uh, recording albums of murder ballads. Like yeah. he's a kind of alternative musician. He, I think, he's friends with Russell Crowe. He wrote a, a sequel to Gladiator. And you can get the PDF, you can read the script online because it was unfilmable. Or I guess they thought it was, like the studio wouldn't make it because it was too surreal. Um, Maximus comes back to life, I think, in it. Oh. And there's, there's some kind of weird stuff with gods and stuff. So they never made that. But they've written another script now, which is more um, about uh, Marcus Aurelius' grandson, who's called Lucius in the movie. You know, like uh, it's kind of a bit different from the characters and, and the real histories. But yeah, like I'm hoping that the movie might have a little bit more philosophy in it. Because I, I thought, I read somewhere that Russell Crowe was really into Marx Aurelius and that he was kind of trying to get Ridley Scott, the director, to put a little bit more stoicism into Gladiator. And there are kind of one or two fleeting sort of oblique references to uh, stoicism and, and gladiator, but I don't think enough. I think it would be even cooler if there were just, not loads, but just like one or two, you know, if one of the characters maybe just quoted Marx or really, people that are into uh, stoicism would have gone nuts over that. They'd be like, oh, this is awesome. He quotes Marx Aurelius at one point, but he doesn't really, like, he says things that sound a bit like Marx Aurelius. Yeah. Uh, but I think in the sequel now that stoicism has become more of a thing that, that maybe they would put a little bit more in it. I, I always wanted to um, when I was writing the graphic novel, I, I guess I had that at the back of my mind and I thought I want to make it a bit like Gladiator but with a lot more philosophy in it. Well Imagine that. That'd be epic. <laughs> <laughs> Ten times yeah. better than Gladiator to be honest. Like if you mix what they did with Gladiator, along with yeah, well, along with the Stoic philosophy, yeah. man, I thought it was a good combination. Um, so, yeah, well, basically, it's Gladiator with more philosophy in it, a lot of philosophy. 
uh, but not so much people talking, standing around talking about philosophy. They do that a bit, but it's more like woven in to various stories and stuff, like I say. And there's a lot of there's a lot of action. There's a lot of interpersonal drama. There's supernatural stuff. And then there's like I thought we have to have like a big battle scene, right? Yeah. Um, and we did that, and then I thought, geez, actually, we've got like about three big battle scenes. Like you know, if you love stuff like that, there's like there's several actually huge like carnage, you know, like um, you know, pretty uh, pretty epic stuff with different enemies as well. It makes it uh, kind of actually maybe there's like five. There's a lot of battles. Like there's a lot, a lot of war in it. Like they might have to cut some of the the wars out. <laughs> no, no. Movie more, it. more wars, man. <laughs> that's that's the whole good thing. stuff because wasn't uh, wasn't Marcus Aurelius famous for saying life is warfare or something like that? He would know. Yeah, yeah. Like, cause he did say that, and it is for him. He was a uh, for let's see, really for all of his. Uh, role as, as emperor, right? We're told by the Roman histories, anyway, like uh, as soon as he was acclaimed emperor, the Parthians invaded Armenia, which was a Roman ally client state. And so that forced Rome effectively into a, a war on the eastern frontier. Yeah. Uh, and Marcus didn't go there, but his, uh, his uh, brother, Lucius Verus, went, his adoptive brother. And so Marcus was nevertheless involved in uh, the strategy and preparing the the, the army, and uh, and then he had to fight a series of wars on the northern frontier, um, and he died there. So like his whole role as emperor consisted of one huge war after another. Yeah, and the plague. You... Sorry, and the plague. And the plague too. He was hit hard with the plague. He did. He managed to survive the plague, didn't he? Until it killed him. Yeah. Until the end. Because <laughs> <laughs> like, I say that, I feel like he kind of survived. He, he he lasted for quite a while through the plague, and we don't know for sure that the plague killed him. We're told that he died of a contagious disease. So the historians are like, ah, plague. Like, because everyone was dying of the plague, so like, it could have been something else. But it was he probably died of the plague. And it went on for a long time. Um, it was different from our pandemic in the um, first of all, the Romans had like no idea what was going on, so they they really did naturally just assume they were being punished by the gods. So the, the instinctive thing was just to go out and hold rituals and um, sacrifice to the gods and stuff like that. It was the best attempt. And actually what they did was they did figure out, one smart thing that they figured out was that it was spread through breathing. And they knew that because even though they couldn't see um, the virus that was causing it, they saw that it would make your skin break out in kind of pustules. And they noticed that tended to happen in your at the back of your throat and in your windpipe, and then it would spread over the rest of your body. So they thought if it always begins at the back of your throat, it, it's probably entering your body through the air when you're breathing. Yeah. Like So they, they kind of figured that out gradually, uh, which was good. But then they thought, well, what can we do about that? And their best solution to it was to try and purify the air by burning a lot of incense, which did yeah. nothing. Like, except, you know, made the place smell weird. Like, we didn't really do so they were burning a lot of incense. Um, can't breathe. <laughs> yeah, that was like the best attempt. That would be even more, if you were dying of like smallpox or whatever, I kind of feel like people waving incense in your face would be, just be even more annoying, you know? But like, the last thing I want right now is somebody shoving a jaw stick in my face. Like, oh. because I, mean, I, feel, I'm about, I feel like I'm going to throw up already, like coughing up blood and stuff. But they, um, so that was kind of a horror story. When you write a prose biography, what tends to happen is you'll describe something like that. They go, there's a plague, and then you talk about it. And then you kind of move on to the next thing, like there was a series of wars and so on. And you kind of forget a little bit that there's a plague, but the plague's ongoing. Yeah. But when you make a movie or do a graphic novel, it's more obvious that no, this thing now continues for the rest of the story. Like it doesn't go away. Like so, it's more present than it would typically seem to be in a, a prose biography. So it does kind of change your perception of what was going on. One thing that 
changed for me was I realized when I was writing the graphic novel um, or working, it's not just about writing it. Like I say, writing the script only took six months. And then the rest of the time I was working with the illustrators and stuff like there's a lot of other um, work that's uh, teamwork that's required. The, um, it, it struck me more than it ever had in the past that Marcus Aurelius was a guy who must have woken up every morning and kind of pinched himself and, and kind of thought, am I still alive? He must have been surprised because not only could he have died at any minute from the plague, he also had chronic health problems. And in Rome, in the ancient world in general, if, if you have health issues, like, you know, you're, you're they know, knew so little about medicine that if you got an infection, yeah. you know, you think, this could kill me. Like, for all I know, like, Marcus was coughing up blood and having dizzy spells and stuff like that. And so, you, you know, you must have felt. So he had his own health problems. He had the plague. People were probably talking about assassinating him. And he had to go to the northern frontier. Some people say he wouldn't have been in danger, um, they think. And Marcus Aurelius wouldn't have been running, riding around a horse waving a sword around, right? But he would nevertheless have been, he was at the front line. And there are some indications that he was actually at the scene of battles, probably you know, at the rear or whatever, kind of maybe on a hill or something overlooking the troops. I would imagine not like in the thick of it. Yeah. But he wasn't miles away, you know, like some kings or emperors would have been. He, he stationed himself um, uh, for a lot of the war at Carnuntum, uh, which is a Roman legionary fortress on the River Danube, which is the, the frontier. And that, we're told by one Roman author, uh, Lucian, that uh, Carnuntum was overrun at the beginning of the war and 20,000 Roman soldiers were killed in one day, which is a massive defeat one of the biggest military defeats in Roman history. And it sounds like, um, we can't be 100% sure about the chronology because of the way that we're told this information, but we believe that Marcus went after that. So he went and stationed himself, we think, at a place where 20,000, you know, just the very idea of that. Like, he must have known it's possible I could die there. Like, you know, even though he was in a, a fortress, like, you know, his safety definitely wasn't guaranteed yeah. uh, it could have been overrun and so he, there's so many reasons that Marcus could have died and his friends were dying um, his brother died at a relatively young age he lost half his children like so having visualised all this I, I really have a strong sense that Marcus woke up every morning and was kind of mildly surprised that he was still breathing crazy I mean, I think another like, day, nobody's poisoned me. Yeah, I think what Roman emperor <laughs> either wasn't assassinated or there wasn't someone that wanted to assassinate a Roman emperor. Yeah. You know, it kind of like came with the territory. You, you know, I mean, you become a Roman emperor, it's sort of like you're going to have people wanting to assassinate you anyway. <laughs> someone can actually know that. Someone should look up, can look up the statistic, but it's a, a surprising proportion of Roman emperors were uh, executed or assassinated yeah, um, like a substantial number yeah. of them so yeah for sure like it was fair, relatively common um, for that to happen and it's amazing how Marcus Aurelius was able to live and survive for as long as he did yeah most He's Roman failed. emperors just didn't have a very long reign there's a later Roman author um, who describes him centuries later though he describes him as having diaphanous skin, like transparent skin. So the perception of Marcus Aurelius, maybe that's partly they saw him as kind of philosophical and otherworldly, like a spiritual being, but they, they perceived him mainly as very a very frail man. Um, and everything indicates, he talks in his private letters about being, getting sick and in the meditations he refers to this as well. But sometimes it's the case that people who suffer from ill health are the ones that live the longest and the guy, you know, look at all the athletes and bodybuilders that, you know, drop dead prematurely from heart attacks and things like that. I mean, it's not a lot, but it, it's not unusual. And then you'll meet people that have health problems all their life, but go, go on to reach 90 or something. Marcus is one of these guys that his entire life long looked like he was sick, but still managed to cling on to life 
like <laughs> for longer than I mean by modern standards he didn't make it to, he made it to 59 I think which is not bad I mean it's not exceptional but it was longer than um yeah, many of his times, uh, friends yeah it wasn't bad like, it was longer than most people thought he was gonna live I mean if you had the modern technology that you have today mixed in with you know back then then I yeah. think you probably would have lasted a lot longer. I mean, there's there's hope for me yet because I've got a myriad of health issues in my uh-huh. life, Donald. <laughs> yeah. So maybe I don't look sick, look but there's a lot of lot of things going on. In I wouldn't worry about it, buddy. If you can just hang on for another ten years, <laughs> like they'll probably be able to clone you. Like you know, they'll they'll, they'll take your brain and put it in a robot or something. Like you'll be well, fine. You won't want to clone me. Let let's just say that. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear but what's um I've, I've wanted to ask you ever since i heard the title verissimus what's that is that a person place it's his nickname uh-huh. like the emperor hadrian were told called him verissimus and hadrian liked to play on words he wrote poetry and he liked to play with words marcus's birth name his family name he was called marcus Annius verus when he was born and Verus means true, can also mean loyal, it means true as an honest or loyal. And Hadrian, for some reason, annoyingly, the, histori- the historians don't really spell out why he did this, but for some reason he decided to call Marcus Aurelius Verissimus. So no, he changed his name from Marcus the True to Marcus the Truest of All, the most true. Like he upgraded him to, for some reason, as a sort of joke. And we don't know exactly how old Marcus was. He was probably a child. I think if we really try and squeeze the historical sources for evidence, I think it's implied that it's round about the age of six that Hadrian looks at this kid at his court and says, this kid's called Marcus True. I'm going to call him Marcus Most True, Truest, for this and us. And uh, the weird thing about this story, I wish we just knew a little bit more about it. It sounds like Marcus said or did something that made Hadrian think, wow, this kid is unfiltered, like uncensored. Mm -hmm. And it obviously, if that's the case, like there's other stories about how Hadrian really persecuted intellectuals, even having them executed or destroying their careers or exiling them. He was a very pretentious man. And towards the end of his life, when Marcus knew him, he became, became very violent, crazy, paranoid, tyrannical. And uh, so people, we know from some of the other anecdotes, if we can trust them, I should say, or attach that, we can't, a proper historian would say we can't really believe everything that's in the Roman histories, but, you know, for the sake of our chatting about it, we'll take them at face value and say this is what they say, that Hadrian kind of terrorised intellectuals and people were frightened to tell him when he was wrong. So one day he used a word incorrectly and he was trying to be clever and he, he got a word wrong. And one of the greatest intellectuals of the era, actually probably the greatest intellectual at that time, was a guy called Favorinus of Aralata. Uh, he was a sophist, an orator. And his followers said, why didn't you tell Hadrian that he got that word wrong? Um because uh, you know these guys were experts in language and Favorina said you have to excuse me if I allow the man who commands 30 legions to be right <laughs> so what he was saying is intellectual cowardice right he goes I'm I'm, t- I'm not telling that guy he's wrong I'm scared of him like he's the emperor like even if he is an idiot right even if he is saying something that's like dumb like well, I'm gonna be awkward now this story obviously resembles Hans Christian Andersen's fable yeah. of the emperor's new clothes, weirdly. It's often the case that you see in ancient history, you think, this sounds a lot like a more familiar story, and maybe even perhaps Hans and Christian Andersen might have perhaps been influenced by this, for all I know. But it obviously has that kind of undercurrent to it, and so in which case Marcus comes across like he's being cast as this child who's the only one that has the balls to tell Hadrian that he's an idiot or that he's something he said is, is wrong. But we're not actually told what he said or did. Like, we just know that he got this nickname, Verissimus, the most truthful child, the most true person at court. Now, 
the only other thing we know about that is that it's mentioned by two different historians for what it's worth. And then another historian says that Marcus named his favorite son, not Commodus, but another son who died very young, Marcus nicknamed Verissimus. So he passed the name on. And also a Christian author, um, just called Justin Martyr, in an official letter, his first apology, addresses Marcus as Verissimus the philosopher. And that's really important because that suggests that he was widely known. Like, so maybe he got this nickname as a child, but everybody knew about it. It became like, a, a, we read the story now, but it was a story that was probably spread throughout the empire and it became um, kind of emblematic of how the public perceived him. Yeah. Um, so much so that someone could actually address an official letter to him and use this title. And also there it's associated, it's, it's implied it has some connection with the fact that he's a philosopher, or at least as a, a hint, because he's called Verissimus the philosopher. And in the meditations, he goes on and on about the truth, like he's obsessed mm -hmm. with truth. So one way of reading Marcus Aurelius is he's a guy who, as a child, was kind of obsessed with honesty. And then maybe there was this scenario like the Emperor's New Clothes that he kind of became notorious for, and Hadrian picked him as a successor, perhaps because he was the only one that had the balls to speak honestly to him. We don't know this for sure, but it's kind of implied, so you could read it that way. And then Marcus in his philosophy goes on to treat truthfulness almost like a religion. Um, you know, it becomes a, a way of life to him throughout the, the rest of his life. Very interesting stuff. I'm, I'm loving this. Uh, Donald, I understand I've got to let you go because <laughs> it's probably really, really late there for you right now. Um, yeah, like the sun's going down like, outside of Michigan and Detroit. Where, I'm in Detroit. Where do you want people to get a copy of your book? I understand that it's coming out July, so around the time this comes out. But yeah, the, the middle of July. Amazon? Get it. And other booksellers, like we have to, we have to say um, that there are many good booksellers. That they, any all good bookshops, you can obtain it. If we get any trouble for just plugging Amazon, um, but uh, Barnes and Noble, Amazon, yeah. and independent bookshops, any bookshop you can order a copy from, uh, especially online, you should just be able to search for it and find it. There's an ebook and there's a hardback edition, um, and someone once said to me. Would there be an audiobook? And I was like, well, how can I make an audiobook out of a graphic <laughs> novel? But apparently, some people have adapted graphic novels into audiobooks, so it's not impossible. Uh, but there, in the short term, there won't, there won't be a, an audiobook. It would require adaptation to turn it into a different format for that. So, yeah, they can get it anywhere from, but it's a good idea to pre order it anyway if this goes out before then, because you can usually get it slightly cheaper if you pre order the book. Yeah, I've noticed that more people pre-order drops the price. So yeah, it can more, do. more people pre-order it. So I think with the the audio book, you can have sort of like a narration, and then you can have the 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 images sort of. I could do that. I could narrate it. We could make it like I could have a little animation. Yeah. Like, or we could just get Russell Crowe. Like, yeah. you know a lot. So you know all the celebrities. <laughs> get uh, get one. We could get one of the ones that've been on your show to play Marcus Aurelius. You're only like one person or one <laughs> connection away from someone famous. So, yeah. I mean, three degrees or whatever it is, or separation. <laughs> Did you, so, I, this may not mean anything to you unless you're into, you know, there's a British TV series that was only famous in Britain, but it's kind of become bigger now since the internet called Doctor Who. You've probably heard of yeah. Doctor Who. Yeah, I right? And uh, yeah, loves it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So, Many people say that the best, their favourite Doctor Who, my favourite Doctor Who, because I grew up with him, was a guy called Tom Baker. Mm. Like, I guess this was like in the mid eighties or late eighties. He played Doctor Who. Tom Baker, Tom Baker, I think looks like Marcus Aurelius. Uh -huh. Like, if he there's a couple of pictures of him where he grew a beard. Like, he has similar kind of curly hair, and he's got similar big kind of dreamy eyes. Like there's a and when he's got his, when he was younger and he had his beard he's, he's too old now really like to play uh, Max Aurelius but he used to I that's who I would have cast young Tom Baker with a beard would have been the perfect Max Aurelius I think we'll fix it up with uh, that and, and yeah, all of it 
Donald, yeah. man, it's always good to talk to you. You're always welcome. Thank you, Grace. Back on the show, but thank you so much for, for speaking to me once again. Awesome. Thanks very much.